Thank you very much. Uh, and I'm uh, appreciative of the opportunity to, uh, to comment. Uh, I also appreciate Maureen and Wendy having put their slides together well in advance. Uh, I put my couple of slides together uh, this afternoon as we were listening to them. And, and so these are uh, just a couple of the points that I wanted to uh, emphasize. And I think that um, uh, we all know in our own minds what Elsie refers to. Um, there's actually been relatively little uh, work in eMERGE um, on the legal issues, very little comment about it today. Some of us may appreciate that, uh, but others probably see major opportunities going forward. And so I would just uh, highlight the fact that that has been a relative desert. Um, I also have always felt that uh, economics belongs in ELSI, not just because it begins with E, but um, that it is a science, albeit the dismal science. Uh, but nonetheless, there is room for much uh, formal investigation as to how economic issues impact virtually everything that we've been discussing and will discuss today. Um, we need to involve uh, the stakeholders, obviously. Uh, payers and administrators have, have been mentioned. Uh, but even beyond that, I think they will respond best to accurate, uh, valid data that uh, the eMERGE network itself could uh, begin to generate uh, formally. And so that would be one uh, important, I think, uh, recommendation going forward. There was an RFA not too long ago um, uh, that began to address some of these issues, but there's clearly much more that, uh, that could be done. Um, as Eric Green emphasized this morning, there are a number of consortia that are addressing a number of aspects of genomic medicine, and uh, most of them uh, involve an LC component uh, by necessity. Uh, certainly point to the CSER projects and IGNITE. Uh, and of course, there are the uh, LC SEERs that have been in existence for uh, going on a decade now. Uh, many of us have been working in these areas uh, independent of eMERGE, and I think it would be very useful if there were some mechanism for bringing those of us working on LC issues together to discuss what we've all been finding, um, whether this is the uh, annual uh, gathering of the SEERS or some other forum, it might be useful uh, to ensure that we're not reinventing the wheel, as it were, to uh, have dedicated discussions uh, are opportunities for discussion around some of these uh, issues. I noted uh, in both Maureen's and Wendy's comments that, uh, and in the title of this particular session, that the notion of education and governance were uh, subsumed by LC. I think that's fine. Uh, we've we've certainly um, uh, heard some ideas about who to educate and about what. Um, IRBs are the low-hanging fruit, I would maintain. And certainly providers are important. And here the uh, uh, ISCC effort, uh, a number of people on this uh, webinar are involved in ISCC, uh, is another forum that is actively engaged. And certainly uh, anything that's being done through eMERGE should make use of uh, what ISCC and other groups are uh, contemplating and uh, testing in the uh, realm of education. Uh, and I think NHGRI generally uh, needs to be applauded for their work in public education, in particular the Smithsonian um, exhibition. Uh, but uh, there's clearly more that, that needs to be done in, in this regard. Um, can we have the final slide, please? Um, so the one issue that hasn't been discussed, uh, but I think falls into the general realm of uh, LC-related activities, is the generation of policy. Um, and 
we have to ask ourselves how important policy is for effective implementation of any of the recommendations coming out of EMERGE or any of the other uh, genomic medicine consortia that are actively engaged at this point in time. Uh, I would suggest that, um, that policy can be very uh, helpful. Um, it can also be a flashpoint as the ACMG recommendations on return, mandatory return of incidental findings uh, emphasizes. But nonetheless, I think we need to um, uh, consider whether developing or at least recommending policy is an important activity that could be done by the eMERGE uh, consortium. A particular area, and I'll end on this note, uh, of interest to me is the whole notion of the duty to recontact when we're smarter. Um, clearly, interpretations change. Uh, Heidi has presented an example of how, from the laboratory perspective, this can be implemented. Um, but I'm also concerned from another, uh, a number of other perspectives, particularly the clinician's uh, perspective, of what uh, are our responsibilities to get back to patients when we do change the interpretation of something we counseled them about uh, at some point in the past. So those are my thoughts. Um, I'm very interested in what our other panelists, uh, Laura Besco, Ingrid Holm, Kathy McCarty and Tracy Trotter, most of whom have identified themselves as being online, uh, have to um, have to contribute. So I'll first ask Laura to comment. Uh, great. This is Laura Beskow uh, at Duke. Hopefully, you all can hear me. Um, I'm an associate professor and the Duke Clinical Research Institute and I have had the pleasure of actually working um, as sort of an external person with a couple of different of the LC projects in eMERGE and um, have found those both fun and uh, beneficial, uh, you know, a combination that I very much appreciate. So it's, it's been great and a lot of good work being done that I, that I look forward to continuing. Um, I'm also a member of the, the uh, regulatory and ethics core of the NIH Healthcare Systems Research Collaboratory. And I was quite struck this morning um, with the discussion about EHR phenotyping and, um, you know, moving into implementation and sort of the area between quality improvement and research and so on. Just the, the real synergies between eMERGE and the NIH Collaboratory that I'm, I'm really wondering if there are ways to, to more explicitly um, collaborate in some way. The, the, the NIH Collaboratory um, already has relationships, for example, with uh, PCORI, um, certain ways that we um, um, interact with CTSA on some projects, and so it really, um, I think there could be some really good um, interactions um, with eMERGE as well. Um, a lot, many of the comments, I had an opportunity to see the slides, and so many of the comments I had were, were already incorporated, and so I'll just make a few um, additional comments. Um, I think that the, the sort of LC component of eMERGE has really done such a fantastic uh, job in terms of incorporating an ethics perspective throughout a lot of its, its different uh, teams, and has done a lot of really good work on soliciting stakeholder input, whether that's through descriptive sort of research, community consultation, and so on. And so those are very important foundational efforts. And I think in Emerge 3, what I would personally love to see is, is very um, focused effort on building on that sort of exploratory uh, descriptive work to actually develop and test interventions designed to address some of these ethical issues. So for example, in the area of consent, um, obviously a lot of work in the, the model language, and that's continuing, it sounds like, with the pediatric language. And I think that that's um, um, fantastic language. Uh, but I think it would also be interesting to actually then go ahead and test that language, um, try to find out about the uptake with that language, see how participants react to it, um, find ways to assess comprehension, and, um, and improve comprehension. Um, so building on that, that initial work to actually um, test uh, and see, see what sort of an effect in ways that things can be improved. 
Um, on the regulatory front, I have my ears perked up this morning with uh, the talk of the eMERGE sites coming together on the data sharing agreement. And I really wondered if there was a way that eMERGE could also demonstrate that sort of um, interaction on the IRB front and find um, ways, whether it's a central IRB model or some collaborative IRB model, to really demonstrate sort of a streamlined way that different institutions could, could work together and sort of get through some of those IRB issues. I would, that would be great to see. Um, with the EHR phenotyping, I think that that presents a lot of very interesting ethical issues. One that I think was alluded to this morning a bit was the idea of um, um, if you find folks with a particular genotype of interest, possibly a rare um, gene variant, that um, the idea of being able to contact them and do more in-depth phenotyping. That is a topic that I personally have done some work on. Um, David Goldstein and I had a paper a couple of years ago where we talked about what happened at Duke when we tried that. Uh, it raised some interesting issues and so to me that's an example of where some descriptive work has been done and so f finding out, exploring that in more um, robust uh, detail, or including coming up with interventions on good ways to do that sort of thing and being able to really make use of, of um, the combination of, of um, EHR data as well as, as, as uh, genomic data. Um, so I'll just conclude with saying I, I really um, would hope that eMERGE could become a showcase of, uh, of robust empirical bioethics. Um, similar to the way that you know, eMERGE has been really uh, um, a great resource in terms of, of creating large sample sizes across the different sites, I, I think that same benefit could apply to uh, bioethics research. I think some of the limitations in some work to date has been things like small sample sizes and so on. And so with the expertise that eMERGE has as well as being able to work collaboratively across all the sites, I think that um, really gathering data to address some of these um, ethical issues is, a, is a, an important contribution that, that Emerge could make. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, is Ingrid Holm uh, on the conference? Physically. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, this is Ingrid. So um, uh, my comment, and I think part of it is that, you know, Maureen and I have been working together and kind of put some of the talk together, but I think that the, the um, and I really appreciate um, everybody's input, um, particularly about Reed and Laura, your perspective on it. I think uh, from, from my perspective, I, I feel like that what, um, what our group can do at this point kind of going forward in Emerge is probably on the education piece of it, and I think the idea of educating IRBs in particular is, is crucial, and, and just, you know, as an example, Maureen and I are now dealing with developing the survey across all the sites, and we've had IRB issues, you know, already across the sites, and it's been rather challenging. So I think, and I sit on my IRB, and I'm always educated, so I think that one of the things that we can do as a group is try to, edu you know, educate IRBs. I also think that, you know, um, Emerge too is kind of all of, is been really about kind of genomic medicine and integrating um, genomics into the EHR into clinical care. And I think to me, like going the next step in terms of how physicians being involved in in how that information is used, but particularly from kind of the patient perspective and using patient portals and. Um, and just, I guess, kind of in general, how, um, and this is one of the comments that um, Marie made too, is that um, how people are uh, take this information, how they use it, and kind of how they feel about it, it seems to me that that's a, kind of going the next step beyond getting the medical record and looking at uh, real kind of clinical support or decision making in terms of PGX, but going kind of far, uh, further on with that. And as a number of people have mentioned, the fact that I think, you know, these uh, patient portals may give us the opportunity to kind of do that. And I really like what Laura was saying about um, uh, this idea of not just kind of developing policies and developing consent, but really testing them. So, for example, testing consent forms and seeing how, kind of getting feedback from participants in terms of 
um, using things like consent forms. So I think as we are um, in right now in our CERT group getting feedback from participants about how they feel about broad consent, we can do, I think, in Emerge 3, um, get more information back from participants about how they view genomic data that they're getting, how they view the consent forms that we're talking. So really trying to get out more in the community and looking at the kind of patient stakeholders or participant stakeholders. I think is, would be a kind of a good next step um, from the from our perspective for um, emerge. Thank you very much, uh, Kathy McCarty. Yep, I'm here as well. And uh, similar to our previous speakers, I had sent my comments through, so many of them have already been addressed as well. So Laura mentioned uh, potential collaborations with the collaboratory and how the collaboratory has in turn collaborations with Corey, and it strikes me that so much of what we've done already is, is very well aligned with what Picori is doing, their initiatives and the, the methodology around including and engaging our patients as, you know, truly as partners. And what can we do to more uh, formally work with Picori? Uh, I think we, would be something to explore. We've talked in the past about how do we engage payers. Very important for doing an AMD maglet degeneration genomic medicine pilot here at Essentia. And one of our questions as we're following up with uh, participants is to see whether or not they would be willing to pay for genetic costs out of pocket. And that's been interesting. Some of them, yes, and uh, uh, varying costs, but almost all of them would want to talk to their payers about whether or not they would cover genetic tests before having them. So how do we try to actively engage them? And I know for myself I've found that challenging when I was still at Marshall Clinic in Wisconsin had contacted the statewide organization of HMOs and just found it challenging to, for them to even identify somebody to come and uh, sit on a, a, a panel with us. With, um, they're just concerned about doing that. How can we try and engage them uh, as part of the community to engage? Uh, IRB education also really important. So I have a new hand here at a sense I've taken on the role of the IRB chair, so I can do some little bit on that behalf. A number of our of the sites within the Emerge Network are part of the HML Research Network, and there's currently a document going around about feeding and having a central IRB within the HMRN comments are supposed to be in, I think, by the end of this month. And it'll be interesting to see what we get because we have almost always have some changes to that document every time it goes through any of the legal departments. And so we need to remember to engage our legal counsel early on in the process when we're looking at that. And then Barbara Koenig has been our voice all along, and I, I want to bring her voice back again. When we're educating the IRB, how do we educate them about the importance of the engagement of communities and incorporating their feedback into our IRB applications? Uh, really important so that, that we could develop potentially have some best practices for IRB. I think this would be absolutely a uh, great contribution to the uh, wider community. Thank you very much. And finally, uh, Tracy Trotter. Uh, Reed, thank you. Um, I think I, about a month ago I was traded to the uh, Panel 7 pediatric team for a, an expert to be named later. Um, but I still have a couple of comments. Um, <laughs> because you called on me. Um, one is the, the overall comment as a pediatrician is all of the LC and consent issues, of course, become more complex when dealing with pediatric patients and po po possibly even more complex when we get into newborns and, and sequencing and things like that. So uh, I look forward to the model language. I, I think it's important that we get um, as many people on the same train as we can on this thing. Um, and I look forward to somebody coming up with good answers about updating new information, updating information as it changes over the lifespan because when your patient's four months old, <clears throat> when the information's gathered, you've got a lot of time to think about that and how to do it correctly and how to do it well. Um, and I'll save the rest for my, my own panel. Thank you. Great. So I think it's time now to uh, open it up to general discussion. Uh, 
Mark Williams again. Um, so I just wanted to come back to the E that you posed, uh, Reed. Um, for those of you that were paying attention to the sidebar discussion uh, earlier, uh, there was a fair amount of um, back and forth about uh, the role of um, adding uh, a component of uh, you know Emerge Three to look at economic or value-based propositions and, and proposals and how to study that. Clearly, that would be something that is um, uh, of interest related to implementation, and we do have precedent in that the newborn sequencing. Uh, RFA that was uh, referenced did explicitly uh, allow for an economic study to be a component of subproject three, which was the um, LC. Uh, and to my knowledge, that was the first one that uh, specifically called that out. Um, clearly, there would be methodologic issues that would arise, much as have been encountered related to uh, variability in IRB, uh, variability in phenotyping, uh, et cetera. But in some sense, if we could develop a model across the network of doing this type of economic analysis, not only would that be valuable for the implementation of genomic medicine, but I think it would provide some uh, methods for shared economic research that would be broadly applicable. So I would endorse uh, a consideration of uh, an economic arm to eMERGE 3. Can I pipe in also on Reed's suggestion of Susan Wolf of a legal, a more robust legal component? Um, I think that's really critical because uh, successful integration of genomics into clinical care requires support of law. And conversely, if institutional leaders uh, perceive or misperceive a legal barrier, uh, that may stop the train in its tracks. So if you were thinking of a, a short list of high-impact uh, legal foci, they would include the CLIA issue we've already discussed, the HIPAA implications, because as soon as you talk about reaching out to family and even posthumous, uh, use of posthumous information, HIPAA doesn't die when a person dies, and so that's a big set of problems. The recontact issue that was already raised, return of results itself raises a lot of legal issues, including rights to refuse, and whether you do need consent for incorporation into the electronic health record. I loved Heidi's idea, I think it was Heidi, about mapping responsibilities within the EHR environment that has a lot of legal pieces to it, including for the biorepository. And lastly, you know, the advance notice of proposed rulemaking is a proposed regulatory change, so it's both ethics and law. So there's a great and really important list, I think, on the legal front. Thanks, Alan. Um, I, I guess I'll echo both what Mark and Alan both said, that I think both the economics and the legal pieces are important. And I just will expand on the um, economic piece that people have proposed population genetic screening for BRCA mutations and for Lynch syndrome mutations. Israel is already doing population screening for uh, BRCA mutations. And since we have mostly population-based samples, we could really speak to the economics of screening and down the road costs. The other interesting aspect of an economic study is that genomic data is different from other healthcare data in that it is persistent. And so if you think about an, an initial investment in genotyping, that information can then be reused over um, uh, an extensive period of time uh, based on different clinical uh, contexts. And that's a very different type of economic uh, assessment of, of an investment. I'm just not aware of anything else in healthcare that has that type of persistence assistance, which I think would be very interesting to study. So on the, the IRB front, one uh, interesting connection is that among the NIH BD2K workshops was one that I was able to uh, co-chair in September on the research uses of clinical data. And uh, for the entire workshop, uh, Jerry Menikoff, who is the director of OHRP, was present and engaged. And one of the observations he made was um, that uh, delegation models are very familiar. An IRB uses a central IRB or delegates to some other member of a consortium. And his personal view was that resulted in no education. The IRB was no better for the next project they reviewed if they delegate. And he was very interested in OHRP actually supporting and engaging in some experiments of IRB consultation and education with one another 
that might improve the performance of the network in a persistent way. So that was OHRP inviting, I thought, uh, organizations like eMERGE to say, let's do some interesting experiments of IRBs that are not just like business as usual of uh, delegation or central IRBs. One, one related aspect is the rather, um, I, I think, overly legalistic uh, format of, of most consent documents. And I, from my point of view, they impede the consent process. And uh, I know Mike Gaziano is, is out there someplace, uh, but a project that he did before the MVP at the VA was, was instituted was to pilot a, uh, a brochure with information about the study versus the formal consent document that had the same information and participants strongly preferred the brochure, which probably none of us would be surprised at. Uh, but I'm unaware of many, many studies of that nature. Um, and, and so I think as part of educating the IRB, I don't think we're going to change CFR 36 quickly, uh, but we might um, we might work towards a, a better, uh, a, a, you know, getting a document that was actually more user friendly and actually communicated what we wanted. Yeah, we should yeah, probably. We should Jeff Botkin, I wanted to make a couple of quick comments here, in large measure to support much of what was said by the panel, but people have called for a uh, formal evaluation of the efficacy and impact of the recommendations that are coming out of the um, work groups, uh, and I very much support that notion, but those types of studies, of course, are fairly expensive, so I'm wondering whether um, the eMERGE network can support that type of uh, outcome study or whether this is something we need to look to NHGRI for an RFA <clears throat> targeted to a, a particular dom domain uh, in that respect. And then let me ask the second question quickly and then I'll, uh, I'll get off. There's the people talk to very much support the notion of IRBs as key stakeholders for the uh, the network here, so I think that's just a wonderful idea. So ha has there been any um, collaboration between Emerge Institution, IRVs, and in support of the network to date? I mean, there's been a lot of consultation at the individual level and um, and also a large study across IRBs in the country that uh, um, several of the sites collaborated on with the GRIP consortia. So um, while I if you're suggesting the incorporation of IRB sort of along with some of our studies, I don't think that has been done, but certainly there has been consultation and work with IRBs in the network um, on at most of the, the sites individually. I think the other elephant in the room in this area is the CTSA consortium. Uh, we are all at or affiliated with CTSAs and one of the three must-dos this year for the CTSA consortium is widespread IRB reliance agreements. So that is going to completely change the IRB landscape across the CTSAs in the next 12 months. So Jeff, I, I wonder, um, I was, this is Harry, I wasn't quite sure you said that, that would, would Emerge be able to support that kind of outcome study in terms of formal evaluations of many of these recommendations. It sounds like a lot of these recommendations are, are you know, things like you can study the, the impact or the, um, the outcome or the attitudes or that sort of thing. That doesn't sound like a huge outcome study to me, but maybe I misunderstood what you were suggesting. No, I think that's exactly what I'm suggesting, and as sort of come forward with what they think would be uh, more appropriate consent language and formats uh, for conducting this kind of research. Uh, I think those sorts of recommendations are quite welcome, but that's different than actually evaluating their uh, impact in terms of people's understanding of key elements of the consent process and their response to the information, uh, et cetera. And it may well be that that sort of thing, just in the flow of research participants through eMERGE, you can uh, look at some of those outcomes relatively inexpensively. But I know as we try to set up uh, studies to formally evaluate different approaches to consent, it turns out to be uh, complicated and uh, <clears throat> relatively expensive process in certain circumstances. So this question was, can you adequately build on the eMERGE network with some supplemental funds to get that kind of work done, or do you really need a separate uh, allocation of funds to do that in a rigorous way? 
Right, and, and I guess you know the how of how we go about this is, is maybe a little bit down the road. We're, we're kind of trying to define the what at, at the meeting today, but but I think you know just to address the how, one might or, or the who, one might also say not all of these questions are are, are uniquely addressable in Emerge, and so you know there there might be uh, other other consortia or groups that we could look at to, to answer them. Um, but I think rather than, than getting into that, let's let's try and focus on the what, and we I think we do have to move on. Yeah, we're right at we're 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 right on time. But Terry, uh, I, I think that the how is something we should be thinking about, and, sure. and hence my suggestion that all these different groups that are thinking about the same things um, uh, need to get together and chat. Mm -hmm. no, excellent point. <clears throat> okay, and an excellent discussion on a uh, uh, topic which segues um, directly to uh, Actually, we have another presenter in the room here in Bethesda, so Iftikhar will be uh, the eMERGE presenter for the topic of return of results.